Practically every time we have a graduation service in this church, when people who are in Christ leave this world and go to heaven, it seems that somebody sings or the congregation sings Amazing Grace. And we know why that is. The fact that God in Christ would save us and take us to heaven will save a wretch like you and a wretch like me. That's always amazing, amazing. There's another kind of grace, not just amazing grace. It's spoken of in Corinthians. In Corinthians, Paul talks about Jesus Christ became poor, gave his life on the cross, so you and I might become rich. That's another kind of amazing grace. Fits into the first kind of salvation saving grace. And it fits into another principle that may be as important as any principle for Christian living that you and I have ever heard and perhaps you and I have ever understood or perhaps you and I have never put into practice in our lives. This could be the most amazing transitional service of worship you and I have ever been in. That's my prayer. This whole thing came into being slowly in my life. As many of you know, I was brought up in a blue collar home in South Mississippi. My daddy put on khakis every day and went to work all of his life. He held two jobs, so my mother would not have to work And my dad literally would shave at night, if you can imagine this, so he wouldn't have to be slowed down in the morning with shaving when he went to work. And he normally left the house around 3.30 a.m. every morning to go to his first job. He worked for the Mississippi Power Company. He climbed poles. In those days, they didn't lift you up. You know, they had those spikes they would tape on your leg. He would literally climb poles and hang transformers and run lines to houses so people could have light. He was a lineman. Also, he had a second job and he worked for a lumber company and he did all the electrical work there involved in the sawing and preparing of logs and timber. And then he'd come home late at night and eat and go to bed, and the next day, that was five days a week, sometimes six days a week. And people who knew Homer Young, they would say one thing about him. He was the hardest working man driven that they'd ever known. Somebody I, about my dad, that's what every single person said. He was passionate about what he did. Brought up in that kind of family, somewhere along the way, I don't know what the age was, when I was maybe four or five, probably six or seven, I be, began to realize that other people had things that our family did not have. For example, for a period of time, we did not have a car. And I said, I wonder why everybody else has a car and, and we don't have a car. I asked my mother. And then I noticed that my buddies got you kid tennis shoes and mine were worn out and beginning to be too small. And I thought they were faster, could jump higher than I could because the shoes, of course. So I said, Mom, you know, why, why can't get a new pair of, uh, of tennis shoes? And then particularly on Easter Sunday, isn't that interesting? We were not sold out to the church. My dad, for 
many years, was not a Christian until in my teenage years. My mother was a devout Christian. We were on the fringe of our church, to say the least. But when on Easter Sunday, and I remember more than one Easter that I would wear the same coat that I had worn three Easter's before, and as I got larger, I remember being embarrassed. Isn't it Sunday how things you remember? And I would hold my sleeves up, you know, so they would be long enough and they would not go up to somewhere between my elbow and my wrist. I remember that, and I, I wondered, you know, why I couldn't have a, an Easter jacket like seemingly all the other kids had. So that gives you an idea of the background. Therefore, when I was graduating from high school, I had saved money and put money away, and my dad was one of 11 children, one mother, and, and my mother was one of nine children, and I was the first person in my family, all the way down my mother's side, all the way down my dad's side, who ever went to college. Think about it. It was a big thing for my folks for me to go to college. So I went to the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, studying engineering, got a job. So I was working my way through school with some money I'd saved and help I would get now and again from my folks. And so I was on my way. So you can imagine how on Mother's Day weekend, I hitchhiked from Tuscaloosa to Laurel, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, to Laurel, Mississippi, and went home and told my mom and my dad that I was somehow, some way, strange as it seemed to me and certainly to them and to all my friends, let me assure you that, <coughs> that God wanted me in his church, that that would be my vocation. My mother was silent. My dad said, son, you know, you have some ability. Why are you going to throw your life away like that? You see, my dad's idea that if you didn't do something with your hands, you couldn't show that I built this, I made that, I fixed that, I worked there, I sweated, that you really wasn't worth very much. He didn't look on white collar folks with any degree of understanding, or any degree of appreciation, and of all things, what he observed in the churches. Those who worked in the church, they were slick, dressed up, nice to people, gave sweet little talks on Sunday, and he thought of all the vocations perhaps he knew anything about. Church stuff was about as low on the ladder as you could get. What he said bothered me a long time, but now I get it. Because that's exactly what I did. I just threw myself away to God and threw myself away to Jesus and threw myself away to the church. I had no one in church entity to exert a scintilla of influence. In class, I never dreamed I would be a preacher of some sort. It didn't matter. I just threw myself into the church. God, God made it imperative that I do that. I really had no choice. In the process, I got married, went to college, Graduated from college, went to seminary, graduated from seminary, and I go to my first church, 
a Texel church in eastern North Carolina, First Baptist Church of Irwin. When I got there, they paid me $4,800 a year. I remember it. Let me tell you, folks, I never felt that rich in my entire life. I bought a new suit. I bought a new car. In the meantime, we had a baby, my first child, Ed, living in a mill house, which was the parsonage. I'm telling you. But it got to the end of that year. We had pledged our budget. Being the pastor, I pledged tithe, tithe plus. But at the end of the year, I realized I had not met my pledge to the body of Christ, which I pastored. Now, nobody would have known about it. Let me tell you that. Nobody knew about it but myself, my wife, and God. But I went to the bank. I remember the name of the banker, Glendale Stevenson, little branch bank there in that little textile community. And I borrowed the money and gave my commitment to the church. That experience, by the way, nothing like that has ever happened since in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But I learned a little bit about what I want you to learn about today, if you hadn't already experienced it, grace giving. Grace receiving, grace living, grace giving. You see, I ran into a scripture along the way that says if we are faithful to little things, we'll be faithful over much And I look back on my home life, my mom and dad were faithful in little things, but I can tell you they never had a chance to be faithful over months. My dad died, my mother died. When my mother died, she left my brother and I the tremendous estate of something a little over $18,000, and he got nine, whatever it is, and I got nine, and that's it. So my parents, very frugal, hardworking, honest, tough-minded, disciplined, stewards, never lived out that verse. Be faithful in little things, I'll make you faithful over much. But I looked at it in my life, life of my kids, their life, now life of their, their kids, my grandkids, I realized how it was a generational thing that God passed down all through those generations to my kids, their family, their kids, and the amazing thing about all of my kids and their, their kids, don't know about all the grandkids yet, almost every single one of them are in the business of the church. I was sort of hoping one of them would amount to something, tell you the truth. (laughs) So I learned about this principle. I want you to learn this principle. It's a beautiful thing to know. It's an important thing to know. And I want you to understand a little bit about grace giving. It's important. It's essential, I think, to really a victorious fun-filled, meaningful Christian life. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, Paul says, and now brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace, there's our word, that God has given to the churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy, have we had a severe trial? Do we know? Now we know a little bit about that. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Sounds like a paradox. 
For I testify, said Paul, that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. Here's the secret of grace giving. They gave themselves first they gave themselves first of all to the Lord. Let me tell you something. This church, the body of Christ, the ands and arms, we don't want anybody to give this church one dime, not one dime, unless first of all, you've given yourself to the Lord. The gift without the giver doesn't mean a hill of beans to God, and that gift will not be beautifully multiplied and used. So this is the first principle of grace giving. Give yourself. Look at the rest of it. He said, so they urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and the love we have kindled in you, so that you also excel in grace giving. You see, they gave themselves, and then they gave more than they were able to give. I don't think there's a person hearing my voice that's ever given anything to the Lord and to his church that cost you anything. I tried to once, ended up not costing me anything. Grace giving. A businessman was traveling in Korea He was outside of Seoul, and a man was driving through the countryside. He looked in the field, and he saw an old man behind a plow, and in the front of the plow was a young man pulling the plow. They were going through a field, and the man said, stop the car, I want to take a picture of that. So he did. And he said, that's a strange thing. They must be very poor for the, the son to pull the plow, the father to guide the plow, and the man, businessman said, oh, no, I, I know them. He said, they're in my church. He said, we had a building fund to build a new building, and he said, they wanted to give something. The only thing they had that they owned was the ox, and they sold the ox and gave the money to the church. The businessman said, my goodness, that must have been a, A painful thing to do. He said, oh, no. He said, that family is so excited and thrilled (laughs) out of their mind that they had an ox they could sell and have money to give to God. Grace giving. You see, those who teach the wealth and health gospel, which is not a gospel, the idea that I'm going to bring $100 to the altar and God's going to multiply it and I'm going to have $1,000. You can hear that on any channel 24-7. Biblical nonsense. Because of that heresy, biblically, we have backed up in Bible teaching churches and not really explained exactly the principle of being enriched through our stewardship and through our giving, through grace giving. And the word enrich doesn't mean that when we're faithful to the Lord, we'll necessarily have more stuff. It may mean that. It can mean that. But to be enriched means your life is full of spice. It's full of pleasure. It's full of things you never would dream of. An enriched life is a full life. Jim Carrey, the actor, comedian, recently said, 
I wish everybody could be rich and famous so they'd understand that doesn't give life meaning. But to be enriched, rich in love, rich in friendships, rich in so many things, that's a different word. And, and God gives us, in Corinthians here, how you and I can be enriched, and it is through grace giving. Listen to the principles that we have here. Look at the 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6. Remember this. Whoever, whatever we sow sparingly, we also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. This is the principle of sowing. If you sow to the flesh, I want more of this, bigger of this, you will reap of the flesh. It doesn't satisfy. If you sow in sensuality and in lust, you'll reap a life that doesn't enjoy the real gift of God in relationships. You sow to the flesh generously, you're going to reap of the flesh generously. You sow of the flesh spiritually, generously, you're going to reap a spiritual reward. Let me tell you something. Did you know our church sows generously? If I'm going to plant something, we're not agricultural people, most of us. We put a few seeds down, we're going to have a few things grow. But we just sow generously. We just scatter seeds everywhere. Our church does that with our tithes and our offerings. This coming Friday, and I hesitate to say this, we don't advertise this, we're going to give a million, almost $100,000 to all the needy people in metropolitan Houston over a seven county area to the food bank and you name it and we're going to spread a million point one dollars this Friday that we have given to all these other entities in this time of need. Our church. We're going to give in the very near future over $400,000 we have accumulated here to needs they still have in Louisiana when they were devastated by the flood. We're committed to that, and we'll do that in the next four months, you say. You say, no, you must, we must have a lot of money. No, we don't. We are challenged now in this time of stewardship as a church, and that's when we do our best giving, folks. So we are scattering stuff generously, and I wish I could be there, you could be there, but when we're faithful in our tithes and offerings, that's how the leadership of our church, primarily laymen, pinpoint the need and what we do in stewardship. Your pastor is not directly involved in that in almost any way, shape, or fashion, except with the big picture. We sow generously, and therefore, you and I are part of this. You and I are there, feeding, helping, sheltering, caring for, arranging for family relationships, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. We are a generous church. We sow generously, bountifully. We're very careful about where it goes and how it's used. Don't make a mistake about that. We're not foolish. So this is the principle. This is the principle how we are enriched as a church and how we are enriched, remember, not just rich now, it's the whole enchilada. How we are in the enrichment business in your life and my life when we are faithful in our tithes, our offering, and our stewardship. So the first principle to be enriched is to sow. To sow. The second principle is to decide. This is very interesting here. Same passage. He says, each of you, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart and give not reluctantly or under compulsion. In other words, to be enriched, you have to decide what you're going to give. Here's the problem. Some people say, well, I don't like to pledge. I don't believe in pledging. 
What does that verse say? It says you and I have to decide, make a decision of what we want to give, what we think we'll be able to give, and we stretch that amount. We decide on that, and then we should make a decision about that. I'm going to be a tither, first time in my life. I'm going to give above and that the first time in my life. We make a decision. We sign on the line. Let me tell you something. God works out our giving in a very level fashion. I don't have to worry about what Bill Gates does with his money. I'd like to worry about it because I'll tell you, I know what to do with about 99% of it. I talked to someone some years ago, and he was talking about giving to his church. He said, how do you give to a church when you're the richest member of the church? I said, when you give to the church, you no longer will be the richest member of the church. That's how you do it. Grace giving. And it says you don't do it with compulsion or you don't do it reluctantly. You never should feel any pressure. I wouldn't put any pressure on anybody, twist any arms, tell 16 deathbed stories and dangle you over the fires of hell. Oh, no. It should be something you decide on. That's grace giving. And look at the last point here. This is the best point of all about grace giving. And he said, and God is also to bless you abundantly. And he goes back, it says before that, for God loves a cheerful giver. The word in the Greek is the word hilarious, crazy. You see, you want your life to be enriched, my life to be enriched. We all do to have blessings and things that come in in so many different areas, most of them spiritual. They could be physical. This, this is how we do it. This is how God operates anytime, every time, and all the time. Not only what you give, how you give, when you give. All that's important, the motivation for giving. This is touched on here. So we have to begin and say, we're going to give, we're going to sow generously. And that's what we do. Then we're going to decide, we're going to have to fill out a card in a few minutes. We've got guards at all the doors. Everybody starts saying, oh, uh, no, no pressure, but those who would like to commit it. And then we're going to give cheerfully and to get the mood for cheerful giving. I like to say something, tell something rather stupid. Uh, A church, I'm told, got a call and the lady answered and gave the name of the church and the voice the other side said, I'd like to speak to the lead hog up there. And the church secretary said, We don't talk about our pastor like that. If that's who you're talking about, we we treat him with dignity and respect for the office. And the man said, well, I'm sorry. He said, I I don't go to that church, but he said, you know, I just hit a lottery and won over a hundred million dollars and I just thought I'd give 10 million to the church. The sister said, "Oh, oh, 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 wait, wait, she said, hold on for a minute. I think Porky Pig just came in the room. (laughs) The point, giving is cheerful, it's free, it's hilarious, it's extreme. And what is the reward? What does enrichment look like? It tells us right here in the scripture. He says, and God is able to bless you abundantly You want abundant blessings so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in everything? How about that? Now, I'm not telling you that. The preacher said, oh, no, no, no. God's telling us that. You want to be enriched? This is how you do it. This is the result. God promises that. I don't. 